Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Seretse Kama Ian Kama, the former president of the Republic of Botswana. If you enjoy this conversation, remember to subscribe, to like, and to share. <music> Your Excellency, Seretse Kama Yen Kama, thank you so much for this opportunity to have this conversation. You're welcome, very welcome. We find you in South Africa mm. and not in Botswana, and you've been here for a while. Talk to, share, share with us, with the audience across the world, why we find you here and not in Botswana. Well, I'm here um, primarily because of persecution. Um, we in Botswana for a long time thought that we were immune from what we have seen in some parts of the continent. Uh, leaders who are driven by greed, corruption, self-interest, undermining democracy, <clears throat> assuming that being in office or being in power uh, is only about themselves and not thinking about the people uh, they are supposed to lead. And we have been hit with this tsunami mm. in Botswana mm. by this man, Masisi, who when he came into office, uh, completely overturned the decades of uh, democracy and the reputation we had earned ourselves as a country. And I think most people on the continent and further afield would know about the reputation that we in Botswana were proud of, that all our um, forebearers worked hard to build. But that has now been totally um, undermined. And this man is just on a mission um, for, for, for himself. And um, there are many examples that mm. I can give you. We'll let's, be here the whole go, day. Let's go to those. Give, give us the specific, mm. really mm. painful examples, ways of attend the decades of democracy that the whole world admired as far as Botswana is concerned. What are those specific issues that... Uh, Rigging of elections. Okay. 2019, they rigged the elections. And that is a cornerstone of democracy when people have the opportunity to vote into office uh, a party of their choice, which would become government, and its leader would become the president. So that was the first thing. Secondly, intolerance. So freedom of speech, freedom of association is all undermined uh, in Botswana. If you are somebody who's assumed to be with the opposition or an associate of mine, you are targeted. And the intelligence service has been weaponized in order to go after uh, his, his opponents. Um, undermining of the rule of law, where we have seen several judgments in our courts where they have determined that actions by the state have been illegal, have been unlawful. We have seen attempt to uh, capture judges, in fact, successfully so, in fortunately a few cases, not across the thing, not across the board. And we've even had somebody, a prominent uh, traditional leader, who came out once publicly and said how uh, Masisi had told her that he had spoken to judges on how to rule in a particular case. So the whole system, the, the law and order, you know, the, the use of the police, the intelligence service, the anti-corruption agency have all been compromised mm -hmm. and charges fabricated against uh, people like myself. Mm -hmm. Our families have been detained, their wives have been detained. And, and, and that, that is the order of the day. Mm. Yeah. Your Excellency, you, were, you worked with, former, uh, with President uh, Mosisi for a long time. You were also responsible for handpicking this man to succeed you. Did you not see these telltale signs that this man was, was not a Democrat? And what responsibility do you take 
for having given the Botswana people this man? Uh, I never saw it when I you was never saw it. No, I didn't see it. But people came to me who did see it. You know, when you are a president, uh, you know, you 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 have a whole host of officials, people in the private sector who come to you and, and, and talk to you about what's going on. But despite that, there are certain things that you won't pick up. If somebody wants to fool you, you you're lucky to be fooled. But the first warning signs came to me when uh, some of my ministers came to me and pleaded with me to remove him as vice president, that he would not be fit to be the president of the country. And I said, why? They said, this man is intolerant. He's divisive. He's immature. And they would come to my office in ones or twos and even in threes, pleading with me uh, that this man needs to go. And it got to the point whereby I just said, look, when I called in my CC and said to him, this is what ministers are saying about you. You know, he would come with <clears throat> stories and everything about, no, no, you know, you should be aware that these are probably people who want my job. And that's why they're doing it. Because in politics, that can happen as well. But it got to the point I said, look, I don't want to be a messenger anymore. They come to me and tell me one thing. I call him, he tells me another thing. So I said, let's all get together. So we had a two-day session in cabinet with him where I said to them, can you say to his face what you've told me and see if we can move forward from this. And that's what happened. But despite that, I still stuck by him. So they spoke to you in front of him. And they said to you what they had said in private? You know, in our culture in Botswana, people are respectful. Although that's something else he has undermined. So obviously they would not say precisely what they would tell me in confidence. So they would put it in a fairly more gentle manner. But still, the message came out that there was a problem. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been sitting there for two days discussing the issue. Um, but like I said, I still stuck by him. So to answer the second part of your mm. question, my responsibility as a result, we are human. We make mistakes. I made a big mistake, bigger than most people, because this has affected the whole country. And, and, and it's a mistake I regret. I have admitted that publicly in Botswana. I have, uh, I have apologized to the nation for bringing this upon them and have said that I will do my utmost to ensure that um, I get them out of office at the next elections. Mm. But I'm really interested in the leadership lessons, mm. uh, Your Excellence, that this incident presents. They say it's lonely at the top. You, and in a position as powerful as the one that you had, you have the yes, yes ministers who come to you and tell you what you want to hear. You have others who politely perhaps might tell you the truth. What are the leadership lessons? You are lonely. You want, you want to get advice that's genuine, that's authentic. Are they those people who are authentic when you have such a powerful position? What are the leadership lessons from there? In, in my opinion, in my interaction with ministers and other uh, senior officials, as much there was respect for the position of president, but when they came to see me, it wasn't to come and just say things that they wanted me to hear. And precisely this example, for ministers to have come to me to say, get rid of your vice president, in other uh, uh, um, in, in other countries, they would have lost their jobs mm. because you are now uh, challenging or querying the, the, the ability of a president to choose uh, uh, a credible person as vice president. So in, in Botswana, then, they, they did come forward freely and spoke their minds. Not today, because today you would hear ministers in their cabinets telling us, they tell me mm. in confidence how bad things are. You know, when they have meetings with him in their cabinet, uh, in, the, in the country, they, they recently, they've been complaining a lot about his frequent travels. I mean, when I was addressing rallies 
uh, recently virtually. You know, I was saying to people that Botswana is the only country, most countries you have a minister of foreign affairs. Most, in most countries. Botswana is the only country in the world where the president is the minister of foreign affairs because he spends all his time outside the country and only comes to Botswana to visit us. Mm. Yeah. You, you, I want to t- take you to a space where you said your mistake in giving the Botswana this president has affected the country. Mm. But I want to suggest to you that it's affecting the region because of the alliances that he's making. I mean, his relationship with uh, the president of Zimbabwe, for instance, you were outspoken during President Robert Mugabe's rule against uh, uh, corruption, against uh, uh, persecution, persecution and, and so forth. Mining of democracy, now, this yeah. man is coming in and is making alliances, mm. those kind of alliances. So your responsibility, your excellency, extends beyond Botswana. What's your pushback? You know, um, I was very much conscious of the fact that Botswana was a democracy. And when we live in a global village, as we do, you can't just limit yourself to within your own borders if you're trying to make the world a better place. Mm. So when we had Zimbabwe, a neighbor, right on our doorstep, and yet next door you had Mugabe, who was doing the opposite to what we believed in. Not that countries have to do what Botswana did, but there are certain fundamental basics that governments should follow if they call themselves uh, democracies. And you can't have a situation in Zimbabwe during the Smith regime Mm. where Zimbabweans uh, fled the country. You had a situation where there were sanctions uh, on the country. Um, the, 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 The majority were being persecuted. And then in an independent Zimbabwe under Mugabe, Zimbabweans are still fleeing. They were still being persecuted. Sanctions were still in being put in place. Yes. Mm. So he said, well, what's the difference between then and, and, and during Mugabe's days? The only thing that changed was the name of the country and the name of the leader. But otherwise, it was business as usual. And I didn't believe that was what the liberation war was fought for. It wasn't fought for that. And, 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 um, and, and so I just felt that even if others in the region wanted to not say anything publicly about mm. it. But we did have our static protocols, which talked about uh, democracy. So why aren't we saying anything about it? Mm. So that's why I said, well, I'm not going to sit back. Whatever, uh, however many people are upset, uh, if you don't stand up and talk about it, it'll perpetuate. Mm. But unfortunately, I was the only one. President, Your Excellency, rather, you've, you've formed the Botswana Patriotic Front. Do you think that's, that's your theme as far as President Moses is concerned, that you should not have done this? Or your, 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 your explanation would, would be, I, did, I formed the, the, the opposition party because of ABCD. Talk to me about why you decided to form the Well, Botswana I didn't Patriotic actually Front. form it myself. There were others who formed it, who then invited me to come yeah. into it, yeah, which I did. Um, and and um, yes, in, indeed, that was my crime for leaving the ruling party. And I left the ruling party because he and his party were violating uh, aspects, articles of the constitution, which were put in place. I mean, you know, you know, my father yeah. uh, was part w- alongside others in forming the, the, the BDP. I was its leader for 10 years. And so I could see that what we thought was uh, um, our foundations and the principles to follow were being undermined by him. So I just said, no, this is not the party I remember. I don't recognize it anymore. So I'm leaving it. And that was why that same year, soon after I left it, they tried to poison me. Um, That's why when I was involved in the election campaign, they fabricated these charges that I had stolen 100 billion bula, which by now, uh, even through the court process, has been shown to be a fabrication. Even the chief justice, in a letter to him, said that, that the thing was fabricated. And everybody knows that. Because if I, was, uh, if I had 100 billion, I wish, I wouldn't be you know, here, for example. I'd be on some luxury uh, yacht somewhere in the Mediterranean, 
enjoying all the mansions I would have bought. Um, so, but he was the one, despite the fact that it has come out in court and in other fora that it was fabricated, I'm not letting it go mm. because we need to get to the bottom of um, who was behind it. He presided over that fabrication. A whole head of state undermining the rule of law and instructing his people in the security services to fabricate an affidavit to get at an opponent. So that's where, uh, um, uh, that's, that's where things headed there. And yes, I'm in the Botswana Patriotic Front. And for now, I am intending, they've got a, a Congress, an elective Congress at the end of next month. And I currently have put my name forward to, uh, to stand as the president of that, that party. Yeah. Before we get there, uh, Your Excellency, I'll ask us to take a short break and come back. When we come back, I'm going to ask uh, uh, His Excellency Seretse Ian Seretse Kama as to whether he wants to come back and be the president of Botswana again. So please don't go away. Join us after the break. He wants to win the coming elections at all costs even if it means eliminating me. Imagine getting free access to the Newsday, the Standard, the Zimbabwe Independent, and the Weekly Digest for a full month. Well, you can, and all you need to do is download the Newsday e-reader app on Google Play Store or scan the Newsday QR code in any of the AMH print publications and start enjoying the quality content. time, Welcome back where, to our conversation with uh, the former president of Botswana, His Excellency, Sarete Kama Ian Kama. Your Excellency, it must have been painful, it must still be painful to walk away from the party that your father started to walk away from the party that uh, has shaped what Botswana has become. Why did you not fight from inside? But talk to me in the first instance about the pain of walking away from this institution. It would be like walking away from your family, from, from your home, uh, from your country. And, um, you know, I did consider it a lot. And that is why I went to the stronghold of the ruling party and organized a meeting of many people from all over that area uh, who had been voting for this party ever since independence, over 50 years they'd been voting. And I said to them, um, that's the area that I, I come from, and I said to them, uh, this is the situation that I'm facing. This is the situation you're facing. Um, I have come here to consult you as to whether you think under the circumstances I should leave the ruling party because that's what I'm thinking I should be doing. And at that first meeting, there were two meetings, um, they were unanimous that I should walk away mm. from the BDP. Mm. And I said, look, let's not leave it just to this meeting. Go back to your homes where you come from the towns and villages you come from, and ask people around there, because they haven't all been able to travel here. Mm -hmm. And then we'll meet again in two weeks and tell me what they say. And we met again two weeks later. And indeed, it was the same sentiment, leave the party. And when we were there at that second meeting, people were coming forward, taking out their membership cards and throwing them on the ground, you know, to show that they too mm -hmm. were leaving. And these again were people who themselves and their parents had uh, been in that party. So the party that I'm now with, the vast majority, the vast majority are former members of the, of the ruling party, mm. of the BDP. So yes, it was, it, it was painful, but you know, um, you can't be, you know, stuck. I wasn't, um, I wasn't there to to, to, to promote the name for the sake of the name. I, 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 I was in the BDP because of 
the, its principles, its policies, its programs, mm. not because of the name, mm. is what I told them. Mm. So the name, you know, is the same, although they've even changed it, um, but the policies and principles have been abandoned. Uh, let's go now, um, Your Excellency, to the specific charges mm. that you are facing. I, I know roughly one of them is that you were carrying a gun or weapon. Can you just outline what those charges are? No, they are charging me with having unlicensed weapons. Unlicensed weapons. Okay. Right. And in the charges, they actually quote the serial numbers of those weapons. Then you ask yourself the question, where did they get those serial numbers from? Because they never removed my weapons or saw them before the charges. They got those serial numbers from the police who are responsible for licensing firearms. And the police told me that this intelligence service had come to our offices asking for a list of your weapons and their serial numbers. So they were shooting themselves in the foot mm. by doing that. Mm. But I have, the li I have the licenses. Now, they then taped off my house, my official residence, uh, denying me entry mm. and labeling it a crime scene because there were we my weapons in there. So we went to court, we won. They then went to the Court of Appeal and they lost at the Court of Appeal. The night before the Court of Appeal was to deliver its judgment, one of my CC's judges in the Court of Appeal informed the intelligence service what the outcome was going to be. They went that night into my house without a search warrant and removed those weapons. So fortunately, I have got the evidence of the weapons being licensed for whatever they are cooking, um, you know, I know it's okay. Mm. Now, normally you would think, and I'm not trying to say that uh, being a former president, you're, you're, you're different from anyone else. But one would have thought, if you just think about it, imagine I did have unlicensed weapons. It would have been the police who would have come to me and say, uh, you know, we think you've got weapons. Would you mind showing us what weapons you have and their licenses? And I would have done that. And then they would say, well, you see, you've got a couple here which are not licensed. Can you regularize that? Or we, we, we are going to have to confiscate them. And it ends there. Mm -hmm. But no, come with a raiding party to my house with search warrants, with charges um, against somebody who has devoted all his working life to the nation. And we have this um, man behaving like a brat, mm -hmm. um, drunk on power, who just wants to get at me and all his opponents and tending, sending the police and all these after, after me and others in order to, to get his way. And the whole idea is to um, arrest me. And I have a report from a foreign security uh, entity which shows that um, he wants to win the coming elections at all costs, even if it means eliminating me. I've got that in writing, and I'm putting it in a dossier, which I'm going to, which I'm working on, which I will release to the media, uh, you know, before I go back. You, you say he's tried to poison you. Yes. Talk to me about that. Well. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it sure. to you because it was a whistleblower who told me and I don't want him uncovered. Sure. Um, but everything he told me step by step about how they planned to do it, mm -hmm. I was able to double check and it ticked all the boxes. Mm -hmm. Then there were diplomatic correspondence mm -hmm. which were shown to me from three different foreign embassies which their intelligence services picked up that there was an attempt to poison me on three occasions. So again, um, the person who managed to get those correspondences for me, uh, we have to protect. Sure. So what I've said is that I would like to have an independent entity from outside Botswana come in, interview me, and I will give them all the information for them to investigate. Because I'm so confident of the attempts to poison. Mm. I'm so confident 
about the 100 billion, which of course now everybody knows is out, and even these weapon charges. So it's my word against theirs. Who do you believe? Mm. So let's bring an independent entity. That has been my challenge. Because I know I've done nothing wrong. Let an independent entity come in and investigate all these things. But they won't take up that challenge. They won't because they know they will be uh, exposed. Your Excellency, and the annoying Botswana the way most of us do, mm -hmm. admiring Botswana the way most of us do, I have been at pains to believe that President Masis wants to kill you, <laughs> that he wants to el eliminate you. I mean, walk us through that. I mean, how does a man like uh, President Masisi come in and think he can undo your legacy, say Ian Seretsakama's legacy, I'm, I'm having problems as even I'm uh, talking to you right now. What is wrong with this man? That's precisely what he wants to do. Because it's all to do with... Um, th there's a word in English, it's, it's called envy. He suffers from um, uh, a syndrome which is driven by envy in that regard. Because... Um, and here I have to be very careful not to sound arrogant or big-headed. But when I left office and I went around to some parts of the country to bid to farewell, um, I was overwhelmed by the goodwill shown to me, the gifts that people uh, gave me. Um, and he was aware of it. So he wanted to inherit the same kind of support and outpouring of goodwill that I had at the end of my term of office. To the extent that when I left office, I said politics is behind me. In fact, I never even wanted to go into politics ever in my life. Um, so I was looking forward to continuing my charitable work, conservation, now having to do more farming because of all the gifts I've been given in terms of livestock and, 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 and equipment. And um, next thing, I found that when I wanted to travel, it was being blocked. Um, the state media were told not to cover me so that I shouldn't be seen. If I was invited by a school to officiate at the anniversary or at prize giving, Two days before the event, the school would call up and say, Cancel. sorry, we've been told to cancel by the Ministry of Education. Um, um, business people who would donate to my charities were threatened by the intelligence service to stop doing that. So the whole idea was to sort of just wipe out uh, my presence, my legacy, and even that of my father. I mean, even now, you know, there was... Um, my father's successor, the late uh, President Masire, uh, not to be confused with Masisi, mm -hmm. Masire, um, pronounced the 1st of July a public holiday in recognition of my father being the founding president. And it's called Sersereti Khama Day. So he organized a Masisi now, a constitutional amendment, you know, where now they want to remove that day and call it Heroes Day. And I said, Heroes Day? Botswana? I mean, we, we, we didn't I'm fight. I'm laughing, but <clears> this We sounds... didn't fight any wars. You know, it's not like uh, Mozambique or Zimbabwe or Namibia or South Africa, you know, where heroes are linked mm. to the liberation struggle. Um, so that's what he wants. But it's just to, mm. to, remove, to remove that. Even at his inauguration, in 2019, after the rigged elections. Because I was told this. We have always mostly had inaugurations outside the parliament by the statue of my father, which was put up. Um, and he didn't want to be having his inauguration by the statue of my father and move the event somewhere else in town. That's how petty he is. Wow. And that's why he's trying to remove. So that's why... The whole family, not just me, is being targeted. Yeah. Your Excellency, I'm going to take you to a bigger picture now. Your persecution, mm -hmm. that's the word you used. 
is a reason that, that some people have given to why a lot of African leaders don't want to leave office. <laughs> because I'm going to leave the office today and the next mm -hmm. thing I'm going to be persecuted. And I think we've seen a number of that kind of thing happen. Wearing your hat as an elder statesman um, and having gone through what you've gone through right now, what does Africa need to do for democracy to be fully embedded, for Seretse Ian, Seretse Kama to walk away from office and be confident that democracy is safe and that he will be safe? Well, when I talked about um, we thought we were immune in Botswana, we've never had that until Masisi's days. Um, uh, my predecessor never persecuted his predecessor. I didn't do the same to mine either. In fact, both the former presidents, when they were both alive, President Masire and President Mohai, who is uh, fortunately still with us, I used to arrange briefings for them about what was going on. Because I said, as former heads of state, mm -hmm. you couldn't have better ambassadors for the nation. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they were getting invitations to go out and visit other countries. And they'd be invited to certain events of an international nature, to speak, speak engagements and so on. So I thought it was important that they should be, uh, you know, uh, um, what do you call it, up to date with government programs and policies. So I would, ar I would arrange briefings for them. And, and that was the, that I just thought was a way to um, keep them in the loop, as it were. Um, so it had never happened until this man came along. So you ask a very interesting question. Why is it that on our continent there are those who want incumbency to be entrenched? Where we've got leaders who go on forever, who will change their constitutions to give them a third term. And you know, when that third term ends, what do they do? Because it's going to end. Then what do they do? Because countries which have millions of uh, 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 citizens, why would they believe that um, they are the ones who should have the monopoly on being in office? Why do they think they are God's gift to their countries? Mm. Um, it's, it's the thing that, unfortunately, uh, it, it could be a mentality, it could be a mindset, that once you're there, it's, it's now all about you and not about the people. Mm. And, 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 and it is so sad that at one stage on our continent, you could detect that we were moving towards um, a kind of situation whereby democracy was becoming. And when I talk about democracy, I'm not talking about the Westminster style or the American style. You know, every country needs to come out with their own form of democracy. It doesn't have to be dictated from, from overseas or elsewhere. But as long as at the forefront of democracy, as a guide, it is the will of the people that should prevail. Mm. That is what is important. Mm. And if you fashion your, your governance on uh, the will of the people, then you're doing okay. When you're doing it, just thinking about your own stomach, then you have lost the, you've lost the plot. Mm. Um, and, and unfortunately... Um, when you have seen in some cases, in some countries, where from independence, some of the, the leaders, uh, you know, adopted the, the, the kind of bad um, uh, habits that we've been discussing, mm. it has a tendency of becoming entrenched. The next leader does the same thing, the next leader the same thing. And it, and it seems difficult to break that cycle. Mm. So talk to me, is the Botswana constitution strong enough to resist a uh, Masisi? Is there something that needs to be done to strengthen this Botswana democracy to withstand the Masisis of the future? It's only as strong as the people who are responsible for implementing it do so. And when the system has been, um, ha has been compromised as what he has done, um, the, for us, the only thing, the executive is rotten, the legislature is rotten because the majority are uh, rigged MPs from the BDP. 
the only thing you've got left that will keep us intact, keep our democracy with some semblance of what it used to be, is the judiciary. And that is why he has been targeting the judiciary. But there has been pushback. And fortunately, the majority of our judges and our magistrates are still very credible people. A couple have been compromised, but I, 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 I believe and, and, and I know that most of them um, still walk the path because the state has lost a number of cases in court. You have appealed to the UN, UN Special Rapporteur. Yes. There's, has, what's been the response? And are you satisfied with the response you've gotten? Well, what they did was they wrote to the government to say, we have got this, and asked them to investigate. And the government just ignored that and just wrote back to them and said, no, no, we, Botswana has a record, a reputation of abiding by the rule of law uh, and, 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 and so on human rights and so on, and totally ignored the issue that was being brought up uh, for their own convenience. And even when I reported to the head of my uh, protection service, who comes from that same intelligence unit, um, who I know is a plant, uh, that there had been a poisoning attempt. Two weeks later, I called him and I said, so, okay, after I told you, who did you report to? Thinking he would have gone to his superiors. And by then, surely one of them would have called me or the police would have called me in and said, can you relate to us what you told the head mm. of your protection? Mm. Nothing. He, t he said to me, no, he didn't tell anybody. So that just answered the questions mm. for me that, no, these people are complicit. Mm. Yeah. So you, you, you were saying, Your Excellency, that you want to stand because you want to get rid of this man. Yes. Talk to me about your headspace right now regarding that challenge. You're going to stand as a presidential candidate for uh, the Botswana Patriotic Front. Right. Please. Exactly. Walk yes. us through that. So, um, um, our party, like I said earlier, most of its membership uh, comes from the ruling party. So, being at its head, I will continue to recruit more members from the ruling party as we go towards the election. In 2024? In 2024, uh, next year. And that has proven very, very effective up to now. So it is something that I want to um, speed up um, more of that, that type of recruitment, as well as to be able to go around the country and um, also motivate people. Not that these days, quite honestly, they don't need much motivation because the majority of the people in Botswana, I can confidently say, want regime change. But also very importantly is to Isn't that sad that we should be talking about regime change in Botswana, mm -hmm. Your Excellency? Yes, I guess it is. Although regime change, you know, can come if people in a normal democracy, you know, want a change of government. Mm -hmm. It should be okay. But not for the reasons that we are seeing, yeah. we are having to do it in Botswana. And then the other thing I want to work hard on is the promotion of a united front amongst the opposition uh, parties and to be able to come up with a single presidential candidate. So, yes, I would be the president of the party up to the election. And that's where, um, when we succeed, then I step back altogether. From, from politics. So it is not... M meaning that you don't want to be no, president. No, no, no. I won't be putting myself up to be state president. Okay. No, it's just to take, to lead the party in its campaign uh, to, to unseat mm. uh, this disease we have. Wow. Mm. We shall take another break here. Last break here, Your, Your Excellency. Please don't go away. When we come back, I'm going to ask His Excellency about President Moses's views on the relationship with De Beers and the issue of diamonds uh, in Botswana. And there's only one reason it's happening. is because he wants the Beers to give him personally something, to give his party something.
Welcome back to our conversation with uh, His Excellency uh, Seretse Ian Seretse Kama, uh, the former president of uh, Botswana. Your, Your Excellency, uh, president um, Mosisi has indicated that um, uh, if uh, De Beers is not prepared to renegotiate the deal that they have over the diamonds, uh, you know, the parties are going to walk away. Diamonds contribute to 80% of total exports uh, of Botswana. What's your view vis-a-vis -vis President Masisi's uh, uh, position? It, it, it shocked the markets. Um, there was a sense that uh, all was well, but clearly all is not well. Is that your understanding? Yes, uh, all is not well. Um, it just goes to prove the immaturity and irresponsibility of the man. Um, the Beers have been partners with the Botswana government ever since they started that relationship back in whenever it was the 70s. Um, formed a company, 50-50 shareholding, called Debswana. Um, but of course, the profit sharing is greatly in favor of Botswana, the government, 80-something percent, and then them the rest, the bears the rest. And they sign on to lease agreements for the mines. And at each stage when the lease agreement has come up, even during my time, you had a team of negotiators from our side who would sit down with the beers team and we would have agreed beforehand what we wanted more. Because as you know, one of the problems on the continent is that we are producers of these natural resources, but we don't benefit from the downstream activities. Sure. So at the last agreement that I was involved in, we said we didn't want our diamonds sold in London through the central selling organization, as it was called there. They should be sold in Botswana. So De Beers set up um, the De Beers um, DT, DTCB mm -hmm. and uh, to do diamond sales in our country. We said um, our diamonds are cut and polished in other countries. We want De Beers to arrange to bring some of those factories into our country for cutting and polishing. That was done. And then also, we also wanted to create our own entity which would sell a percentage of the produce outside of the uh, De Beers uh, arena. So th that, was, that was agreed to. And initially we started off, I think it was at 15% of the, of the production, knowing that over time that could increase, depending on the capacity of that entity to be able to actually sell that, that quantity. Um, so these, these, these um, agreements have been renegotiated with uh, De Beers during my father's time, the first president, his successor's time, Masisi, and then Remohai, and during my time, without a problem, without much of a problem. And now suddenly we're alarmed to see that a partner who are so dominant worldwide in the diamond industry and their marketing arm, which we very much rely on and depend on for the selling of our diamonds around the world, is now threatening to chuck out and bring in people who have got no such experience or ability to do what De Beers has achieved. And there's only one reason it's happening, is because he wants De Beers to give him personally something, to give his party something. And, and, and he wants something out of it. And that is how he conducts himself with everybody. And, and that's the reason why it is. And that's why he'll go public, which is also unfortunate, that if you're in a deal with somebody, you would try to thrash out what your differences are, if there are any, and then, and then be mature about it. Mm. I don't go, you know, uh, throwing your toys out the pram like he does mm. and, 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 and really uh, cause what could be a very serious um, situation for us if he was to carry out that threat. Are you worried? In terms about, of are you worried? I am worried. Many people are worried. You know, since it's been happening, you know, even people here, people back at home are saying, but where is he leading us mm. to? Because, you know, the thing is when everything collapses, 
and when things go wrong, he, he, it doesn't seem to affect him. He just goes on as long as he is amassing wealth. That's all that, that, that he cares about. Mm. And then we are going to have to come in and pick up the pieces mm. and try to start again. Mm. So everything that has happened, you know, the economy is being eroded, our democracy is being eroded, our, 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 you know, our tourism is wildlife based. You know, when I looked, you know, I told you I'm yeah. a conservationist. Yeah. You know, we were able to reintroduce rhinos after many years into the wild. And I could say three quarters, two thirds of those rhinos were poached after I left office. And they then had to go and <clears throat> pick them up and put them back into a protective sanctuaries where they were still being poached, which is something which has never happened before. The man just doesn't care. And he has undermined and reversed most of our gains that we've we've achieved since independence. Mm. Your, your Excellency, as, as you sit here, I can tell that something's brewing. And as, as, as a Pan-Africanist, as an African, uh, I, I am worried. What are the prospects of reconciliation be, between you and President Masisi? Well, there have been attempts. Um, uh, uh, a couple of heads of state in the region have tried. Um, one or two former heads of state from the continent have tried. Um, elders from my area have tried. Elders from his party have tried. Clergy have tried. He has rejected all of them. And the reason why he's rejected is that he does not want to see me around being able to influence the outcome of the coming elections. So he knows that if there's any kind of agreement or reconciliation, if I'm on the ground mm. at home, mm. uh, that is a threat to him. Mm. So um, the other day, I think it must be now two months, he was addressing a rally in my area. And he made some kind of conciliatory remarks along the lines that, no, he would, it would be his wish that one day we would be able to resolve all this thing. And that was on a Saturday. Um, so that evening and the next day, Sunday, people were calling me. They said, oh, did you hear what this man said? You know, he actually, you know, was talking in conciliatory terms. And I said, but what he's saying is what others have been trying to bring about. And he's the one who's been rejecting it. I don't believe him. So they said, no, but, you know, if you don't kind of respond, it may look like you are the one not wanting to uh, reconcile. So the next day on the Monday, I posted on my page that fine. Uh, hearing what he said in Shushan, I'm here with one of my brothers, or both of them, but I'll, one of them could go back, who actually served in his cabinet at, in the early days, and um, could meet him and hear what uh, he's proposing, or his representative. It did. It died there. Nothing came. I called his bluff to show mm. the people that no, it was just the usual way that he misleads people mm. with, with with what he says. So reconciliation? No, there's nothing on the table right now mm. because I think people have just realized that he's um, uh, given up and they're con continuing to take actions, harassment mm. towards me and my family. Um, also show that he has no, uh, no, no, no appetite um, or intention to do that. Your Excellency, would you use this opportunity to address President Masisi directly facing that camera? Um, I think peace is important in, uh, in, in Botswana uh, for the region. I think some form of reconciliation is, is important. Would you take that challenge, Your Excellency, to address him directly? You know... You know, I would if I was dealing with somebody who I thought was a reasonable person. Um, but I'm not going to take up your offer, sure. Because uh, this man has tried to poison me. He has locked up members of my family. He has fabricated charges against me. Um, there's not much I can say to him directly. Others have tried and failed. Um, his own colleagues. Um, and I, I just think uh, if I thought, you know, as a citizen of Botswana, as a Botswana, we pride ourselves uh, 
in believing in the word is both, which is a way, an, uh, an all-embracing word that really, in short, I would say it's about respect for one another, respect towards each other, how you relate with other people in, 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 in a manner uh, which, which is you consider others in your society, in your community, as part of your family. And he has broken that, uh, that culture, that character of us as a nation. So if I knew that he was representative of a true Motswana, who would be prepared to accept and, 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 and reach out, whereas every day we see them, you know, knocking the heads of people or his opponents, not just me, you know, the dossier I was talking about mm. will show you all the press releases and statements that have come out from civil society and other political parties about what he's done. So it's not just against me. A lot of people he has tried to harm um, and, and bring down uh, who he considers his opponents. So it would be a waste of time, you know, can I, can trying I, to address him directly. Can I push you, Your Excellency? And say to you, and please push back and 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 do, refuse if you may, that you are the bigger person here, and for this crisis to be resolved, perhaps the bigger person ought to stand up and be um, at a higher uh, moral ground, and and reach out to the man who is uh, causing problems and show the world that Sarete. Ian Saretsa Kama is bigger principled than this man. Is, is, would you still decline my invitation? The, the way I am, I will do anything in life if I am sure it will uh, deliver results, the intended results. I will not do anything if I think it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And like I say, we are dealing with a different person in, in Masisi. Mm. We're dealing with a different person altogether. So, you know, if you look at people like, uh, who can I give an example of in the world today? Putin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean... What an example. <laughs> I know. But how many people have tried to see him? His yeah. own colleagues, heads of states, before and after the invasion, mm. went to Moscow sat at opposite ends of that long table to try and plead with him to not to do what he had done or not to do what he had started. And it came to nothing. You know, those kind of people with that mentality, they have a mental block that you cannot penetrate, you cannot get through, no matter what you, no matter what you try to do. I hear you. I so hear you. Your excellency. I would say even better people than me have tried. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. I hear you, Excellence. As we round off, I want to... Um, a lot of people out there don't realize that uh, you were educated in Bulawayo, in yes. Zimbabwe. You were educated, educated in Babane, in Swaziland. Yes. You were educated in Ikeja Police College in Nigeria. I sense a molding of a Pan-African. Talk to me in the first instance about your days in Bulawayo uh, and, 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 uh, and, and Swaziland, if you may and what that did in the person that you've become? Well, you know, when I was in Bulawayo, in those days it was Rhodesia. And um, I started off my primary school at home in Botswana. Um, and that was before uh, independence. And the education opportunities were not that wonderful. And that's why my parents said, okay, they found this school in a neighboring country, Rhodesia. And um, I, I went off, I went there, and um, it, it, it was an eye-opener. What, what school was it, by the way? Whitestone School. Whitestone. Whitestone, okay. yes. Mm. It was an eye-opener because Rhodesia then was leading up to UDI. And it was like a mini South Africa during the apartheid days. It was a mini apartheid state, if I can put it like that. So it wasn't very comfortable. That's why I moved, my, or let me say my parents moved me to Swaziland, now Eswatini. Which school was that? Uh, Waterford, okay. Gamshaba, which was a 
multiracial school. It was kids from all walks of life, from different countries. And, and, and here it was right on the doorstep of South Africa, doing what South Africa then, under apartheid, didn't want to see. Different races uh, mixing together and so on. So that was, after coming from uh, Rhodesia then, was so refreshing, you know. And then after that, I went to um, uh, further education after being in Switzerland to the UK and Switzerland. Yeah. And then, Stanhurst. And then Sandhurst. I went to Sandhurst, Sandhurst. yes, Sandhurst. Sandhurst, yes, the military training. But, uh, and then to Ikeja. Ikeja. Yeah, in, in Nigeria. Yes, that's true. Um, and since I've been here, I have been invited to join the Africa Forum, which is a forum of former heads of state. Um, and and it, it's a forum which has tremendous potential uh, for the continent. I have been invited to be patron of the Pan-African Heritage Museum, in which is being set up in Ghana. Um, and that for me is also something which is very close to me. On this weekend, I'm going to be going to Rwanda to receive an award um, for, for work that I've done for charity uh, when, when I was in office and since I, I left office. Um, and it's the first of its, uh, the occasion is the first of its kind. And I'm very honored and privileged that I have been chosen to be one of the first recipients mm. there. And, and, um, and I've also been asked to be part of a grouping who are going to try and promote dialogue uh, between, you know, to, to resolve the situation in northern Mozambique as well. So those kind of things mm. are things which I, I, I relate to a lot. Yeah. Yes. You, you, you must be going through a lot of pressure. And in terms of pressure, I think we all go somewhere. And sometimes the place that we go to has a lot to do with the way that we were raised. Talk to me about where you find comfort and uh, any memories about uh, you, the, the old man, your dad, and your mom. You know, um, uh, I try to, as much as possible, maintain the routine I had before, which involves about three hours of um, gym mm -hmm. every day, one and a half in the morning, one and a half in the afternoon. Here in, in, in this part of South Africa, every day, like from Zimbabwe, we have citizens of our country coming through here. So I have a lot of meetings with them, you know, who come through and so sure. on, you know. So those, those are, and, and from here, I'll be going to, to another meeting. The issue of the political mm -hmm. situation in Botswana, I'm involved in mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one thing COVID was good was it ta taught us how to continue to remain in touch virtually. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of that is, is, is going on. So it's just to immerse yourself in all these things which are going on now. And my family are here. So that is also, you know, I last left them. Well, my brother would be living in his house, the other brother in his house, me and my house back in Botswana. But here... We're all together. all together. So wow. it's an advantage. Yeah. Wow. So that that helps a lot. We love books on this show, Your mm. Excellency. Mm. Books and before books, yes. Okay. Before mm. we let you go, any mm. books that um, you know you found comfort in? Uh, and uh, any books that have shaped your, the way that you see the world that you'd want to share with our book-loving audience out there? Well, you're obviously trying to embarrass me. Uh, <laughs> no, not because, at all, Your Excellency. <laughs> there was a period in my life yeah. I read yeah. a lot. But I was always, when I was from the time I was very young, I was always a moviegoer. All right. You know, and when I grew up in the, in the capital, there you would, you, there was one cinema, and um, you would only see movies on a Friday and a Saturday. You know, so I always look forward to to the Friday movies. But with the advent of television, uh, even music, I used to listen to music a lot in those days. You know, we used to travel, you know, on the roads, long distances. You know, put in a cassette yeah. player in your vehicle, listen to music, and so on. But for me, 
if I have spare time, it's the television. So in the morning when I gym, mm. okay, I have the television on where I catch up on the news and I go through different channels to hear mm. what's going on in this country, mm. in, in, uh, around the world, and the same in the afternoon mm. when, when I gym. So that, that um, I haven't uh, read a book for some time. That's okay. Yeah. We will yeah. we'll forgive you. Thank you. Uh, can I push you though? To, would you have a message for the Abamguato in your language? Is that a message that you'd want to deliver or you're going to decline it again? <laughs> <laughs> I've given them messages. Um, but um, let me say... In, in your is language, directly. Mm. Is mm. in Bangwato Hell. Mm. Ile ra hore nya ba ga itso ke siame eh ke itso hore lona le na le mathata eh go bo tswana me go ta sia modimoteng ke le bogile ke le bogile thank you your thank excellency you thank yes. you very much we we wish and pray your excellency for the sake of Botswana and the sake of sake of southern africa that uh, the problems between you and President uh, Masisi get uh, resolved. Uh, it, it's sad to see uh, Botswana degenerating and becoming another failed African state. And hopefully that's going to be arrested and that you and President Masisi will find each other and resolve these issues. We thank you so much for thank finding you very the time much. To, uh, you. to have this conversation with us. Allow me, Your Excellency, to remain sitting there to address our viewers who are all over the world who follow this show every week remember we are a weekly show we are out every monday 7 a.m central african time and to ensure that you don't miss out on any of these quality conversations we invite you to press on this red button and subscribe go onto our website where we have all this conversation in post podcast form for your listening pleasure and click onto the link for your listening pleasure until next time cheers to you all